separately in their own lecture, but um, this is just a brief introduction. Viruses are acellular, so they don't have all the characteristics of a typical cellular organism, like mitochondria and things that can allow them to make energy or, uh, or replicate their own DNA and so forth, or RNA depending on what type of virus they are. So they're the smallest of all microbes, but there are some pretty big viruses that approach the size of the smallest bacteria. So there is some overlap there. And they cause a range of diseases. And one of the more startling things they can do is cause certain kinds of cancer, like HPV, for example. The um, human papillomaviruses can cause cervical cancer, for example. Morphologically, they're very diverse, and so you can see from these pictures. But viruses can have all possible variations of nucleic acid as well. So single-stranded RNA viruses, like the current coronavirus, SARS-CoV-2 is a single-stranded RNA virus. Um, double-stranded RNA, or which is an unusual arrangement in nature. There aren't a lot of examples of double-stranded RNA in, 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 in biological systems, but viruses are an exception single-stranded DNA and double-stranded DNA viruses all exist. And so you can see morphologically how they're quite different. So this type of virus called a bacteriophage is a virus that primarily, that exclusively infects bacteria. And so one common arrangement of these types of viruses looks like this, and it's very unusual to see. Um, but this is what they look like, and I've seen them under the electron microscope before. They have a very sort of, you know, human-made appearance, very geometric um, protein capsid that's essentially a, um, an icosahedron. And the icosahedron is packed full of some sort of genome. Typically, it's double-stranded DNA for bacteriophage. They typically have a tail that contracts, basically behaving like a, you know, in, in a way, almost like a syringe to inject the genetic material. And they often have tail fibers that um, allow them to dock onto receptors on a susceptible host cell. What you don't see here is this little structure here called the base plate. And the base plate typically has spikes in it, which allows the virus to um, punch holes in the susceptible bacterium. And then this contraction of the tail allows the genome to slide into the bacterium. And then the bacterium will become an unwitting um, virus factory. So T4 is an example of a bacteriophage. Another kind of virus, M13, looks sort of like this. It's far less sophisticated looking than this guy. But imagine it like a, almost like a, um, an ear of corn <laughs> with these, with these um, spikes sticking off of it. You know, and this, this is basically the, the capsid. Again, the capsid is just the, the main shell that, that protects the genome, whatever the genome might be. So in this particular case, M13 has a single-stranded DNA genome. T4 has a double-stranded DNA genome. And these are, again, are prokaryotic viruses, typically, that infect bacteria. Oh, down here you see the eukaryotic viruses, um, or examples of eukaryotic viruses. And so poliovirus or papillomaviruses. But they can be either naked. So again, just a little naked icosahedron, where the, and here's the capsid, shaped like an icosahedron. The nucleoprotein core is just the genetic information plus some associated proteins to protect the genetic information. But some viruses are enveloped, and so they actually have a lipid bilayer around their capsid. And so here's the capsid, and then the genome, and then an envelope around this guy. And usually the, the, the viruses will steal the envelope from the host cells once they infect them. And I'll show you that down the road. But again, SARS-CoV-2 um, is an enveloped virus, and it looks kind of like, you know, has this sort of arrangement. But so is HIV and rabies, lots of other viruses. So just getting into a little history now, um, you got to start, any, any microbiology topic on history has got to start with Van Leeuwenhoek. Um, and, and so Leeuwenhoek was a a lens grinder. He was <laughs> certainly wasn't a microbiologist because there was no really microbiology back then. So he was a lens grinder and he was really interested in certain biological, well, I don't know about biological, chemical questions. Um, and one of his, one of his questions of the day was what gives pepper its sharp taste? And so he, he hypothesized that pepper, you know, has jagged sharp edges. And so it, it, that's what causes that peppery taste on your tongue. And so he set out to prove that by make grinding a lens so he could look at pepper grains under the microscope. 
But if you could see his little microscope here, and if you get a chance, I mean, so at some point in your career at Cal Poly, if we ever get the heck back to campus, you can go up to the fourth floor and there's a um, showcase with with some replicas of the Leeuwenhoek microscope. But anyway, the, the specimen would go here at the end of this point. And here's the lens right here. And then this th thumb screw allows you to kind of focus in or focus out on the specimen. But the point is, is he couldn't get pepper to sit at the end of that little point. And so he had to emulsify the pepper in some water. And when he did that, he detected little things that he referred to as animalcules. <laughs> the term is right here. Animalcules, these small little animals that were swimming around in the water. And that got him you know, obviously quickly disinterested in how sharp pepper is and turned his attention to what these tiny little creatures were. And so here's some of his um, original observations showing motility, for example, and different shapes of things, cocci and rods, and then different shapes of, or different lengths of rods, and even some corkscrew shaped organisms or microbes with high levels of um, unusual arrangement. Louis Pasteur is arguably, arguably one of the most important, if not the most important, microbiologist, and his work was taken, um, done in the late 1800s primarily, where one of the main things that he did was worked on fermentation. And so he, he showed that wine spoilage, for example, is caused by microbes. And he, he used that concept of microbial spoilage to um, invent a process called pasteurization to, to mitigate the spoilage process because losses in the wine industry were huge and that's why they basically brought them in to, um, to help them figure out how to avoid wine spoilage. And so the first great thing he did was show that wine spoilage was caused by the wrong kinds of microbes getting into the wine. The second great thing was he, he showed this process of pasteurization, which is gentle heating to reduce spoilage microbes without destroying the quality of the product. We still use pasteurization today, obviously. Most things are pasteurized that you find on the shelves at the grocery store, or liquids primarily. Um, <clears throat> but not just liquids, but those are the big ones, like milk, for example. Um, but this process of, of you know, understanding how microbes spoil wine led to the um, germ theory of disease, because um, Pasteur reasoned that if microbes can spoil wine, then they should be able to spoil blood, too. And in fact, his work then um, led right into, segued beautifully into pathogenesis and microbes as the cause of disease. And then not surprisingly, once you, you know, same thing here, once he figured out that microbes are spoiling wine, he came up with a process to mitigate that. And once he realized that germs were spoiling blood, he came up with a process to mitigate that as well called vaccination, in which, you know, dried or heat killed or chemically killed microbes could be injected into individuals to stimulate an immune response, a protective immune response without the fear of getting the disease. The role of microbes in disease wasn't immediately obvious, and so that was one of the most important things that Koch, um, I'm sorry, that Pasteur had done, had contributed to establishing the connection. Um, but you needed special tools, and so um, I'll talk a bit about those. And once it was established, it led to the study of host defenses like immunology. So the special tools I'll talk about in a minute, but Koch um, worked was basically contemporaneous with um, Pasteur. I, I get from what I've read, they don't didn't care for each other. It was kind of weird that they had sort of a rivalry rather than a you know symbiosis. But anyway, Koch um, developed postulates that proved cause and effect in microbial infections. And so this is just paraphrased from an old book that I found at a bookstore from the 1920s. But so the author of the book, it's called Microbe Hunters, and the author of the book, Paul de Creef, was sort of paraphrasing what Koch might have been thinking at the time when he decided to start using science to understand medicine. And so Koch had gotten a microscope um, from his wife, uh, who you know apparently gave it to him for a birthday present. But Koch was basically sick and tired of trying to figure out how to cure diseases when he didn't even know what caused them. And that's what this paraphrases here. And then, you know, eventually his work 
through his work on the microscope, he started showing, well, look, if I, you know, look at this tuberculosis lesion, for example, lesion, for example, I can always see these little tines of microbes in, in the, in the lesion or a, uh, an animal or a, or a patient with anthrax. He could, he could, you know, look at their blood and find these little sticks and threads as he called them. And so, um, obviously there was pushback as there always is when, when not always, but as, as there is a lot of times when somebody has a revolutionary idea. And so consumption due to a germ basically means, um, consumption was an older term for tuberculosis. And so when the, when the, you know, doctors and physicians of the time said that Coke guy is crazy, he thinks that, that consumption is caused by a germ, a tiny little germ. How could that hurt people? And so, you know, you see these, 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 um, <clears throat> this pushback, but eventually Koch established his postulates, which really um, kind of closed the door on the argument of microbes causing disease. And so, in this particular case, he's working with anthrax, and these are actual micrographs of of the anthrax blood of infected animals. So Koch was a doctor, but you know he was a country doctor, and so if somebody had a problem with their sheep, they brought them to Coke as well. <laughs> so someday he's, he's, he's looking at children and some days he's looking at sheep. But anyway, the point is, is that he's able to, to use this simple workflow. <clears throat> anyway, blood from a dead sheep stabbed into mice. So he's getting a susceptible, you know, test animal like a mouse to transfer blood from the dead sheep into these susceptible animals. And what's cool is that his, the tool that he was able to use was baked wooden slivers. So he was essentially using aseptic technique to transfer the microbes from here to here. And then asking this fundamental question. And again, this is from that old book and I, the, the author is taking some, you know, doing some poetic, uh, um, taking some poetic license here because I highly doubt that this man, this rigid German man, spoke this poetically. <laughs> anyway, but but the but the point is, you know, he asks the question: If I take blood from the sheep and put it into this healthy mouse, will the mouse die of anthrax? And then he he basically answers this question: They're here, these sticks and threads swarming in the body of this mouse. So that sort of that sort of creates the proof of concept. To, for his um, postulates. So here's po the postulates is applied to tuberculosis, but, but um, so postulate one, the microbe must be present in all people or, and you can put animals in there. So all people are animals with the disease and should be associated with lesions of the disease. So Koch says, it's only when man or beast has tuberculosis that I can find these blue stained rods. And so the tool that he develops obviously is using the microscope to actually look at tissue. And then he's got stains that he's developed to, to, to see them. And, and Christian Graham and some others had come up, were, were working on these problems of how to stain microbes. And so the Graham stain, for example, came out of it. So, um, so staining bacteria and looking at them under the microscope was not novel. But using that to, um, to establish cause and effect in diseases was novel. So then postulate two, the microbe must be isolated in pure culture from a human or animal that has the disease. And so this was the issue though, coming up with a medium that the, that the researchers could use to actually recover the bacteria from the infection. So obviously Koch's postulate number two is no good if you don't have a way to culture the microbe. And we still have this problem, like for example, with syphilis, we, we don't know how to culture syphilis in pure culture. Um, we can culture it in cell cultures, but not in pure culture to actually work with it as a colony. But um, it hasn't stopped us from establishing that the, that particular bacterium causes syphilis. So postulate three then, the microbe, the isolated microbe, when administered to a human or animal, must now cause the disease. So if we take a look at this, you have a sick individual, you isolate a particular microbe from that sick individual, and then you administer that isolated microbe to a healthy animal or human. And then the last postulate is basically closing the loop. You have to re-isolate the pure culture from the intentionally infected human or animal to satisfy the third postulate. And so here's Coke in his lab, his messy lab, <laughs> looking at things under his little microscope.
So <clears throat> some of the innovations then, you know, Koch's work led to the discovery of auger, which was which is a huge innovation because at the time they'd been using potato wedges. And you know, again, most things don't want to grow on low nutrient potato wedge, you know, it's starchy. Oh, come on. <laughs> it's starchy. And so the it's star 